I think we're going to get going. <laughs> Thank you. Very nice. Very nice people. This sounds very loud. Is it too loud? No. No? Okay. It's usual. It's my dulcet baritone. <laughs> All right. So, welcome to my presentation. Um, I know some of you here. Uh, I know. I don't know some other people here. My goal here is to talk about how we build really interesting communities in GitHub. And I'm going to delve into how this is going to work in a few different ways. Um, for those of you I don't know, I spent a bit of time with XPRIZE, used to be a community manager for Ubuntu, really passionate about how we build strong and effective communities. So I wrote a book called The Art of Community and uh, founded a conference called the Community Leadership Summit. Um, now, to be very clear, I've been at GitHub for two months. So I'm new. I've got that new employee smell. And uh, it smells like an octocat. And, uh, and so what I'm going to be talking about here is, is going to be a mixture of some of my perspectives being new at GitHub, uh, but also perspectives from 10 years or so of really thinking about communities and how we can apply them most effectively. So I don't have all of the answers. I'm hoping to have a Q&A section at the end, but bear in mind that you know, I'm no meetings an expert. In fact, one of my colleagues in the back, Brandon, he's been around for years, so I'll defer all the hard stuff to him. Um, now, a little competition later on. You can win these. Ooh. Big OctoCat, little OctoCat. So later on, I'm going to ask for some feedback about interesting stuff that we could do in GitHub. And kind of the most popular, the most popular suggestions were in these two different OctoCats later on. So stay tuned for that. So when I joined a couple of months ago, I was thinking, you know, I joined as director of community and I was thinking about what do I see as the kind of overall focus of the work that I want to do here. And it's to essentially empower all GitHub users to build strong and productive communities. You know, I, when I think, look at conferences like Scale or other conferences, you just see incredible examples of people getting together with a shared interest and building incredible things. You know, we see this in the Linux world, we see this in the web world and elsewhere. And my goal here is, I think GitHub is, an, is a very important piece of how we can do that but we can make it way better. And I'm going to talk about that in really two areas. I want to talk about the present, which is what can we do today, practically today, to help build interesting and effective communities. And then later on, I want to talk about the future, some thinking around what we might want to do to build more effective GitHub and how that fits into a wider ecosystem of different pieces. So my hope here is that the first part of this presentation is going to be very practical, stuff that you can take away right now, you can take some notes, and you can apply it right away but then to kind of delve into what the future could look like as well. So let's first of all talk about the present. In my view, uh, this is really important, communities are fundamentally experiences. And the example I give here is imagine a restaurant. When you show up to a restaurant, your whole experience is mapped out. When you, when you show up, if you drive to a restaurant, do you valet your car? How is that going to work? When you walk in, how do they get you seated? Do they bring your menu first of all? Or do they bring you a glass of water first of all? Do you get water at all? Um, how do you order what you want? What order do they bring it? How quickly do they bring it? And then you've got all the environmental elements such as the look of the restaurant, the music, and all these different pieces. And it all, this amalgamation of all of these individual bits results in a cohesive experience. And if it's really good, you don't notice the elegance of that experience. And to me, communities are exactly the same thing. <laughs> when you show up at a new community, wherever it may be, and you've got an, a, a successful, uh, effective, and sleek experience, then it's incredibly enjoyable and rewarding for that person to, to, to join. If that experience isn't well mapped out, then it can be really complicated and infuriating, and you lose a lot of people. People don't know how to get started, they don't know what to do, they don't, don't know where to get help, and things such as that. So I tend to look at community management through the perspective of how do we build these really effective experiences for different types of people. So today for the, today for the present practical stuff, I want to talk about the experience of a new contributor. And this is invariably where I think a lot of open source, some, a lot of open source projects don't really get it quite right. They don't think about what that experience is, and consequently they have all of this new fresh blood that wants to join a project but they make some simple mistakes or they miss certain opportunities to make that a really elegant uh, method of joining. And I think if we get this right, 
our communities grow, we get new blood, we get fresh perspectives, and we do interesting things. So I think of it in terms of this thing called the on-ramp, the new contributor on-ramp. And I think there are basically five areas. So imagine the person at the bottom here, on the bottom left, is brand new. They may have heard of your project, they may have not heard of it. The person at the top, when they get to the top of this ramp, they are feeling, they are feeling engaged, they are feeling rewarded, they have enjoyed their time. And these five areas is, first of all, discover. How do you learn about what this community is, and how do you learn that you can actually get started and get involved? Because sometimes that's not particularly clear. The second piece is, how do you develop the knowledge and the skills that you need to succeed? And in my mind, that's not just in terms of the programming language and the tools that you're using, but also, how do you contribute something? How do you throw it over the wall so they can bring it in? The third thing is identifying tasks. You've joined, you've, you've discovered a community, you've got the skills, now you need something to do. How do you give someone that thing? You, know, you want something that's not too hard, but rewarding enough that they feel like they've accomplished something. The next thing is going to be getting help. You know, everybody's got questions, so where do you get help, and who are the kinds of people who you want to provide help? Not everybody is a people, not every person is a people person, and you want to make sure that people, people, help people. That made no sense. Um, and then finally, when that person has made that contribution, you want them to feel a sense of kudos, a sense of respect and thanks, because the most powerful thing in communities is building a sense of belonging and a feeling that you're part of something that's bigger than you. And it's really rewarding. So I'm going to go through each of these and show you some practical ideas and things that you can do today. Let's start out with discover. How do we effectively help people to discover projects and that they can participate? Well, one of the first things you can do is add a meaningful readme file. It's a dead simple thing. You just create a markdown file in your repo and just add some basics about what the project is and how they can get started. And what I'd recommend in these is that you explain what the project is, you can either link off or you can provide some steps how you can, how you can start using it. If this is something that's a piece of software that you build, explain how to build the thing. And then maybe link off to places where people can ask help, such as IRC or email or Slack or something such as that. If you want to go a step further, build a GitHub pages site. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but you can actually build a website that's essentially hosted on GitHub. And uh, there is some tooling that's already there to make this really simple to do. So this can be essentially your portfolio website where you have a, an interesting project, you point it towards you know, myproject.github.io, and it explains what the project is and how they get started, and maybe some testimonials and some other bits and pieces. Everybody should have a website for their project, and just keep it simple. It doesn't have to be a massive CMS with all kinds of content. Start simple and evolve it as you go on, and GitHub Pages is a great way to do that. The next thing is regularly schedule social media. Social media is really powerful, and it's a, a fairly rare and complicated science in how it operates. There's a great tool called Buffer uh, that's free to use, and they have like a pro version as well, where you can basically say, I want to post content at these intervals, like every Monday at 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. Eastern Time, or Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, or whatever. And then what you do is you basically fill a bucket full of social media messages, and then it will post them for you. Uh, so what, what, the way I like this is that every Sunday evening, you can basically sit down there, you can think, what do I want to get out there for this week? You fill your buffer up, and then it takes care of, of moving things out for the week. It's a really useful tool. But also, look at some of the best practices that surround social media. So for example, on Facebook, if you want to post something on Facebook, you want people to see it, make sure you have an image attached to it, make sure it's 505 by 505 pixels wide, and it's high contrast, such as white text on the black background. It performs way better. So there's lots of like, little tips and tricks that you can do there. Another tip for Facebook, if you want to post a YouTube, if you want to post a video, don't link to a YouTube video. Facebook would only go to YouTube, so the thumbnail is tiny. Upload it to Facebook. It's much more, much bigger image, and, uh, much bigger picture, and therefore people will click on it. So get your social media in place. All right. So let's now talk about um, developing knowledge. So at this point, we've pushed out social media. We've got our GitHub Pages website up and running. People who stumble across the repo have got a README file in place. You know, we're in pretty good shape. Okay. We've, We've got a good step in terms of, in terms of people actually uh, knowing what our project is. Now it's about developing knowledge. And I think one of the first things we need to ask ourselves here is, what does getting started look like? 
You know, how do we get started? When we think of new contributors who come to a project, you know, it's, it, I think it's important to unpack what their expectations would be and what some of the missing pieces are in how they get started in a particular project. And I think of it in these three kind of ways. The first thing you need to help them figure out is tooling. If you want to build software or you want to build books or you want to build legal documents, whatever you want to do in GitHub, you need tools. And you want to help that person get those tools installed as quickly as possible. So understanding where they're coming from and how they get those tools set up is a good thing to do. So for example, in the Ubuntu community when I was at Canonical, this was really easy because people who were building, uh, who were participating in the Ubuntu communities were using generally Ubuntu, so we could just paste links for downloading all of our various tools. But in your community, you may have people using Ubuntu or Fedora or Debian or using a Mac or Windows or whatever. So think about how they get that stuff installed as quickly as possible. The second piece is provide a tutorial to get somebody contributing something as quickly as possible and break it down into a series of steps. People like tutorials because a step-by-step -step, uh, set of uh, instructions is cognitively a lot easier to process than a massive page of text. And I think about that within the context of two areas. How do you create, a, how do you create something and then how do you contribute it? So the contributing piece in GitHub can be relatively straightforward because we have pull requests, we have issues and things like that that are fairly consistent in terms of how they operate for different projects, but they're used in different ways. Um, so you want to make sure that some people who are new to your project may have never submitted a pull request in GitHub before. So don't assume that. Um, so put together a tutorial that does that, and then you're going to want them to link off to wider documentation. All the kind of details about how they can do different things in different contexts. So if you're building a piece of software, you might want to have docs around you know, the layout of the code, coding standards, um, different ways of contributing. So think about what that getting started journey looks like. And then the next thing I think you should look at is creating a contributing.md file. This is relatively common in GitHub projects. It's basically a markdown file. And again, just a really simple set of steps for how somebody can participate in the project and get started. The other thing at this point is think about the different types of participation. In most open source projects, you can do code and documentation and translations and all these different pieces. And it can be, it can be tempting to try and provide this for everything. And that's the optimal solution. You want these different roles and to make it really easy for those different types of contribution um, for those people to participate. And then just start out with one. Let's say you just want to encourage programmers. Just focus on getting that journey right first. So create a contribution.md file. The next piece, which I think is really important, is to create a knowledge base. So there's a wiki built into GitHub. Um, this is a really simple tool for essentially creating uh, material together. And you know, there's various projects that have done this very well. But here's a the screenshot kind of gives a good indication of this list to a sense of resources and translations. And think of it as like a manual. You know, when you join a company, you have a company handbook. Think about what your project handbook might look like. And the wiki is a great place to do that. Now, before I move on from the, from the knowledge piece, I think there's some tips and tricks I'd like to share that I think are important. The first thing is being concise. I wish there was a, is there a plural for concise? Consistency? No? All right. There is now. Consistency is important. Um, be concise. Concisely. Conciseness. Fair enough. All right. Conciseness. <laughs> I prefer consistency. Uh, it's important. Bear in mind that we're living in a world today where so many people are engaged in social media that our attention span is a lot shorter than it used to be. I think 10 years ago we could get away with big reams of text on wiki pages explaining how to get started. You just can't get away with that now. People don't want to read that. So really try to get down to the bare brass tacks of how do we do this thing and keep it really short. And that's why I like step-by-step -step breakdowns. The step-by-step -step tutorials are important, and, but really clarify like how, think about the linear workflow of how that person goes from this point to this point effectively. And then provide really practical, runnable steps. Um, you know, if you're showing how to get a piece of software up and running and built, provide command line instructions for how they do that. Um, if you are going to be showing how to submit your first pull request, include screenshots that show how they do that as well. So think about if you're the new person, what you'd want to see, what makes you feel comfortable in that. And I think cross-linking is really helpful, but also do it within reason. You don't want to create like a litany of little pages of content, because that's irritating. So 
So crossing where it makes sense to move between different bits of how your knowledge base works, but try to think of how you reduce the amount of bouncing around that you do. All right, so next, next one is identifying tasks. How do we get the right kind of task to someone to, um, to get started with something? And my view traditionally here has been you want to give someone something to do where they can be successful in accomplishing something in less than a couple of hours. So you don't want to give somebody like big chunks of work. But this is really hard because you may have a very accomplished developer join a project. You may have someone who's brand new. So there's no silver bullet to any of these things. But one useful thing here is to create bite-sized issues. So in GitHub issues, you can tag them, um, create a bite-sized tag, and then these are for small things, string fixes, translations fixes, little bits and pieces that you can do. This is something we've done quite a lot in the Ubuntu project, and it's worked out pretty good. So when someone joins your project and says, hey, I'm new, I'd like to get started, you can point them to your knowledge base, your step-by-step -step instructions, and say, why don't you get started with this issue? This is a nice, simple way of getting started. And then, of course, you could use the GitHub API to pull those issues and display them in different parts, such as on your website, on your GitHub pages website. Another thing that you may want to think about is Waffle. Has anyone used Waffle? So Waffle is basically, has anyone used Trello? Okay, so Trello is like a Kanban-type um, workflow tool that is pretty popular. And Waffle is basically that that backends to GitHub issues. So you can create like a project view of how you want to build your project. And Trello is really good at that, but you can do it in Waffle, but then the actual cards that you use are actually GitHub issues. And it uses tags to kind of organize them in different ways. It's a really neat tool. I have to confess, I've only used it a little bit, so I'm by no means an expert, but the, the amount that I've played with it is really kind of neat. So this is a, you know, for thinking about what your wider set of um, to-do items is going to be, this is a nice thing that you could do, and then you could tag them as by size bugs. All right. Um, so getting help. Um, I think this is really important, because when you join a new community, it's nerve-wracking. You know, people are coming from a variety of different backgrounds. So you may, you may, this may be your first time in an open source community. You may be socially a little anxious about joining a community with a bunch of people who maybe you look up to. Um, so things like submitting your first pull request is really scary. Um, just building something yourself can be scary. Just knowing how to get started. Posting your first issue can be scary. So having a support network and getting help, I think, is really important. Because you want people to feel comfortable in being able to do stuff, but also to feel like they're, they're joining a social group in that, they, that feels approachable. So there's a few things here I think are good to think about. First of all, you could tag issues with question or help needed. I've seen a few projects doing this. So if you've got a question, you just basically file an issue. Uh, and, and you could have essentially members of your community regularly go through and review those and uh, respond as you see fit. So this is a relatively simple thing that uses existing infrastructure. GitHub doesn't really today provide a lot of um, communication infrastructure outside of issues, um, which I think is something we're going to need to think about moving forward because it's, it's really important. So you might want to look at other communication channels. So the classic in the open source world is mailing lists, particularly popular with developers. You don't have to go and set up your own like, mailman thing. You can go and just set up Google Groups. They're dead simple. Um, but then you may want to have some real-time communication in place as well. Obviously, for many years, we've been using, uh, using IRC. Uh, I'm a big fan of IRC. use it every day. Uh, the new contender that's becoming really popular is Slack. Uh, I use that as well. It's pretty cool. It's basically IRC in a nice window. Um, so these are great tools for providing providing a place where people can ask for help. Now, one caveat out of place here is that if your community is very small and maybe dispersed over a bunch of time zones, maybe wait a little bit until you put the real-time communication like IRC and Slack in place because you don't want somebody showing up all excited to ask their question and there's no one around. So mailing lists are better because they're you know, batch communication. You just respond when you can. Another good thing for helping, for providing a sense of help and support is, to, is, is events, things like sponsorship and mentoring. Um, if you have a project, have, helping to connect a new person with an established person is a really useful thing to put in place. You know, so someone joins, they, they pick off a bite-sized issue, they're excited to get started, and then you can connect that person to 
you know, uh, an established contributor in the project, and they can essentially help them through it. And in the Ubuntu project, we call this sponsorship. And Daniel Holbach has done tremendous work in this area and helping to craft what that process looks like. Someone basically creates, fixes a bug, uh, essentially attaches that to the sponsorship queue, and then that's reviewed by people who, who are established in the project. Uh, and what that does is it, it kind of relieves that tension of your first contribution because you've got a friendly face reviewing it. That's a nice thing to put in place. And then, of course, you might want to think about things like hack days and bug squashing events. These are great to do online because you can have a global audience. Or if there's people in the local area, then maybe meet up in a coffee shop and, and that kind of thing. Uh, organizing these kinds of events uh, before shows such a scale is a really fun way of doing this as well. So, as with everything in community leadership, there's no single silver bullet solution to everything. You know, there's lots of different options. And you just choose what's right for your project. One of the things that I think is really important about, about defining good support resources is creating a culture where asking questions is okay. And that means you never tolerate somebody humiliating or belittling somebody for asking a question that they consider to be silly. No questions are silly. You reward people for asking questions. You say, you know what, that was a great question to ask. Let's see if we can document it to help other people. And then the final thing here is receiving kudos. So again, you, you go through this. Like if you imagine you're new and you've got to this point, you've had a bit of an experience at this part. You know, you've gone through a lot. You've, you've discovered it. You've learned your skills. You've found something to work on. You've worked on it. You've got some help. And you get that in there. It gets merged in. That is a watershed moment for that person. It might be just another day for an existing contributor, but that's a big deal. And you want to thank them. And I think you want to thank them in three ways. First of all, thank them for their first contribution. You know, the first time they get something in, say, really appreciate it. That's brilliant. You know? That could be on a pull request. It could be on an issue. It could just be a personal email. The second thing is to thank them for their first insight. When somebody says, you know what? This could be an interesting way of doing it, or this could be a different way of doing it. That's an insight where they're thinking about the strategy or the direction of doing something. And you want them to feel comfortable in offering insights. Because not everybody is comfortable at doing that by definition. And then the third thing, which I think is really important, is thanking somebody the first time they challenge you. The first time they say, this isn't the right way of doing things. I think we can do it better this way. I disagree with what you're trying to do. Because that builds a culture of challenging the status quo and doing things different. And that's what we want in our communities. When we all think the same, we get crappy software. So I think these, when we think about doing this for the different people who participate, it, it, uh, the amalgamation is a rewarding, a rewarding uh, experience for people. But then we want to showcase great work as well. And I recommend doing this in six ways. So imagine people do interesting stuff, um, and you want to highlight that person's contributions. I first of all check if they're comfortable with that, because some people like to have a low profile. But imagine. Jane Blogs does something really interesting. Highlighting on Twitter is a great way to do it. Uh, highlighting it in a blog post is a great way to do it. Highlighting it in your, in your communication channels, on your mailing list, in your Slack channel, in your IRC channels. Um, if you have a podcast or you're talking and doing an interview in a podcast, name checking that person for the great work that they've done is great. YouTube videos. YouTube is a tremendously powerful method of talking about what you're doing and, and getting the word out. And again, highlighting those contributions and highlighting those people. And then finally, at conferences and events, when you're up giving a presentation, mention people who've done great work. They feel great about it. Sitting in an audience watching a presentation and getting a name check is a great feeling. So these are, when we start doing this, it really builds that personal connection. It builds that personal sense of relationship, and it builds that sense of belonging um, that's critical in communities. So that's what I'd recommend as some starting points. And these are not... You don't have to do all of these things. These are just ideas to get you started thinking about some practical ways in which you could build effective communities utilizing GitHub. But now let's talk about the future. And um, as I mentioned, I'm still quite new. So I'm still figuring out how GitHub works. It's a big-ish company. Um, lots of remarkably intelligent, passionate people. Um, all who want to do the right thing. It's been a remarkable experience joining. And I'm trying to figure out like, 
what the future should look like, not just in terms of how this happens within GitHub, but what I think of this. And I want to share some perspectives on that, and then I want to get into, you know, if we've got some time, some ideas from you folks about what we should be focusing on. My overall philosophy, and some of you have seen me say this, so I apologize, <laughs> particularly him, is, <laughs> as some of you all know, I'm incredibly passionate about communities. And the reason for that is I believe that we, as a human race, are inefficient in the way that we're collaborating with each other. And I, I think that because fundamentally we, we see these remarkable examples. We see, we see the, you know, the birth of open source and the impact that that's had changing how we live our lives and how we run infrastructure and how we think about building software to huge collaborative development around Wikipedia. People essentially documenting uh, human knowledge to local projects that's just sustainable farming and local communities, to the new maker revolution that's happening, which is, which is happening, which is democratizing how we build and manufacture things. And then significant political change. We've seen communities form and basically say enough, enough is enough. And the basic premise of this is that people are getting together because they have a shared passion and a shared ethos and they feel enabled to do something. My view is that most people don't know how to put communities together very effectively. Um, I'm not suggesting I have all the answers, but what I am suggesting is that this is not about having all of the answers, it's about packaging up the answers that we do have in consumable ways that people can, can utilize. Um, so my view is that if we can help build some, a methodology and an infrastructure and a structure around how community management and best practice operates, we can communicate that out widely the ripple effect on how we as human beings create things will by definition increase. It will, we will become more effective, we will become more collaborative, it will be more rewarding than you can imagine, and we'll build interesting technology faster. That's one of the reasons why I want to go to GitHub, because I see GitHub mentioned at the heart of how people are building software and how people are innovating. But I think there's a lot that we can do to make it better. So my view is that we have a challenge. This is the primary challenge that we've got at GitHub today. And I'm going to illustrate this with a scenario. So imagine, imagine you've got someone called Dave. Dave has an idea. He thinks, you know what, I'm going to make a really cool Slack killer. I don't like Slack. I don't like IRC. I want to make something better than both of these. So Dave has an idea, spends some time with Jane, a friend of his, and they come up with some neat ideas about how that could look like, and then basically build a prototype, and they stick it into GitHub. Put it into a repo, because everybody, that's where, you, that's where you put code when you want to collaborate with other people. Put it into GitHub, and then things, I'm going to spread the word about this. So, write a blog post, they tweet about it, they stick it up on Hacker News, they get all their first to upvote it, uh, and they spread the word. And they hope that they get people interested, and they get crickets. Not that much really happens. They stick it up there, they maybe get a couple of people who file a few issues, a couple of pull requests, the old wiki page, but nothing really happens. I have no data to back this up, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that this happens in the majority of cases that people put stuff up into GitHub, or any site. This is not just applied to GitHub. And what these people want is a community. They want a passionate group of people getting together, working collaboratively, collaboratively on that code, on various other ways, and bringing to the surface the very best in what human beings offer to make that thing better. The problem is that building a community is really hard. And when I joined GitHub, I, I sat down and thought, you know, I've been thinking about community for years, but I've never been able to really firmly articulate why it's hard. And this is a, as everything, it's, it's a, it's a it's in progress. This will change the next time I present at scale. But the way I look at it is that building a community is hard because you're essentially building a workflow. And I think a workflow looks a little bit like this. Is that first of all, you have all of these different pieces that fit into an effective community. And this is just an example. This is not the be all end all of what it looks like. But how do you have ideas and how do you articulate those ideas in different ways? Um, how do you communicate with each other? How do you define which ideas are the most interesting ideas and communicate with each other to bring those to the surface. And then how do we plan the implementation of those ideas? Some communities 
plan very explicitly. They have work items and burn down charts and things like that. And Bushu is a good example of that. Some communities are much more freeform. You show up and you write a patch and you shove it into, in, into, into GitHub and you're off you go. Um, how do you build software? What tools do you use? How do you test that software? Um, which frameworks are going to use? There's, there's, a mass, there's books and books written about just that piece. And then <coughs> how do you build, community, uh, build quality into that? How do you test the contributions that are coming in? How do you maintain code? Um, how do you ship? Shipping, there's been books written about it. What's your release strategy? How do you segment your releases? How do you support your releases? Do you have a regular release cadence? When you ship something, how do you promote those releases? And how do you get the right eyeballs on it? Um, You've got things like participation. How do you get people involved? How do you build an effective participant base? How do you build an effective user base? How do you represent diverse and underrepresented groups in your community so it feels not just a bunch of white dudes? And how do you govern? How do you lead and build effective leadership around your community in a way that feels independent, that doesn't feel forced, that doesn't feel like it's serving somebody's own personal agenda? This is really hard. And my, I'm positive that most people don't really know how to get started with this. And they get some of these bits in place, and they don't get other, the, other bits in place. And my view is that we, if we make this repeatable, it helps to build more effective communities. But it's not that simple. Because I think when you look at that, the different ways in which you traverse that workflow depend on the types of people that you're thinking of. And I, I consider to be, these to be different experiences. So you remember my example earlier on about the, about the restaurant. There's different, different experiences traverse that workflow in different ways. So as an example, with new developers, it's essentially that on-ramp that we already walked through earlier on. That's the way I think of it. And the way you construct that on-ramp within that workflow is going to be different than if you did it for a core developer. So you have various considerations like new developers generally lack context. They don't necessarily know the community. They likely need to develop knowledge and skills to participate. You know? they should, they're probably going to be pretty self-conscious about the first contributions. So these are some of the considerations to make. But then also if you look at another example such as core contributors, then context is essential. That's really important. Um, a core contributor is going to spend a lot of time thinking about they've got the benefit of hindsight, the benefit of experience, the benefit of knowledge. And you see this all the time in communities where a new person shows up and says, why aren't you doing it this way? And the, the core contributor thinks, we have talked about this so much. There's no way we're doing it that way. Because they have context, they have experience. Um, and core contributors, you know, they, they have a repeatable workflow. They're doing the same thing over and over again. For a new contributor, it's the first time they've done it. So you want to make sure, when you're having to do something over and over again, you want it to feel sleek. Because if it has any spiky bits poking out the side, it's going to scratch your skin a little bit and it becomes annoying. And core contributors also play important mentoring roles. You know, because they've got the benefit of hindsight, the benefit of experience. And if they're the kind of people who enjoy mentoring, then you can connect them to, to new, new people. And importantly, core contributors set an important leadership example. Um, there's a lot of discussion and debate about what's acceptable in open source communities in terms of conduct and communication. And my view is that whether you like it or not as a leader, you should set an example. Um, and you should set a good example. It doesn't mean you have to be um, politically correct about everything. It doesn't mean that you have to treat everybody with kid gloves. But what it does mean is that you have to instill the culture that you want to grow in your own actions. Um, and that in itself is a hard topic. And it's something that we could provide a lot of guidance around in, in, in terms of communities. Um, and also, of course, in, with core contributors, we have governance. You know, go, core community members cannot just, in, cannot just be governance members, but they can also influence governance members as well. You know, when we look at uh, particularly large open source communities, there's a delicate fabric of politics. And, you know, Many people at scale who I've met, and I'm sure all of you have done this, you've all been having conversations about the various political climates of different projects. This person's doing this, this person's doing that, and what are their intentions? And core contributors play a big role in how we define the culture of that. Um, and then, importantly, core contributors often build relationships with partners. You know, if you are a big open source project and you're a leader in that, then you're going to start having companies knocking on your door or other projects. 
projects. And you have to figure out those details as well. So my overall goal here is I want to help GitHub users be able to create that workflow, build those experiences as efficiently and as effectively as possible. You know, it shouldn't be, I wrote a book called The Art of Community. People should not have to read that book to build great communities. People probably shouldn't read that book anyway. <laughs> but people shouldn't have to do that. The tools and the systems that we have in the world today should make that easy for us. A big inspiration for me in this thinking, and I know some of you are not going to like this because it's, it's a, a non-free uh, product, is meetup.com. Meetup.com is unbelievable in two primary areas. First of all, the experience of creating a new meetup group is really slick and simple. And it, empower, and it sets you up for success by asking for the most important piece of information, setting the right expectations. Like one screen is, um, I will commit to organizing in-person events, agree. Just that tiny step is like a little reminder in your head that lives there that you should be doing that. But not just that, it's the discoverability of, other, of meetup groups as well. You sign up for a meetup.com account, you specify where you live, you say what you're interested in, and it actually builds really interesting suggestions of local groups to go to. So I think we should be thinking about how we infuse that spirit and that methodology into our tooling. And obviously I'm focusing on this in GitHub, but GitHub is not just github.com or github enterprise. It's a wide kind of fabric of, of integrations. You know, we want to make sure that GitHub is working well with Jenkins and various other tools, uh, whatever workflow that you want to set up. So that's basically my broader vision and goal of how we do this. Then there is another, another piece here, um, and then I'll shut up and we can start talking together instead, is just what the GitHub community looks like. So I see as of having two buckets of communities, which is a horrible mental image, by the way. One bucket is the person who creates a repo and they want to build a community for their project. That person who has the Slack pillar idea and they create the repo and off they go. And those are the people I want to empower to build really strong and powerful communities. But then the other group is the wider GitHub user base. Whether you are a maintainer or whether you're just a user, I want to find and explore ways in which we can build a strong GitHub community so that we can help each other, we can support each other, we can bring the best of what we've got to the surface. That we can understand the needs of our users as effectively as possible and respond to them as effectively as possible and build a real relationship. And I'm not going to deny that's really hard. And it's really hard because, for example, when I was at Canonical, and I was working in, a, in, in the Ubuntu community manager position, by definition, everybody who joined our community was sharing a, an ethos, which was they were passionate about Ubuntu. And even if they were members of Kubuntu and Zubuntu, it didn't matter. They were all part of the same basic group of people. GitHub isn't like that. We have radically different communities in, across millions of repos. So building the overall GitHub community is not like everybody has a shared perspective, a shared ethos, which is the typical sticking point that people have and how people glue together in communities. Um, so this is going to be a, a very different type of thing, and I'm really thrilled about the challenge because it's, I don't think there's any clear answers to this, but I think there's a lot of very clear opportunities to this. So that basically wraps up my main talk, and we should give these away. Let me just show you what this looks like in person. Unboxing. Look at that. Yeah. So earlier on, <laughs> Brandon, put your hand up, Brandon. This is a wonderful human being. I showed him this. He's like, really? <laughs> like, these are pretty rare. Most people don't get these. So if you come to the GitHub office in San Francisco, we've got this big swag store, and we give free t-shirts out and stuff like that. But these are pretty rare. So this is a very special, uh, little special giveaway. So I was thinking in the spirit of... Um, just conversation, because I'm new at this, and I'd like to understand more about what you folks think about GitHub and what can be improved, what's working well. Um, and I was thinking maybe share your ideas for what you think would be cool to see in GitHub, or if you want to ask ideas for things that would be cool for us to work on. And then I'm gonna, for each suggestion, I want the audience to apply.
applaud. And whichever is the most excited response, the winner will get this, and the second person will get this. Make sense? All right. Hold on, hold on. <coughs> oh, we have a mic. Sorry. Recording, so yeah. Can you? It went really bad the last time Jono gave me a microphone. So see how this goes. <laughs> Maybe um, <he's> great. <laughs> it does work. <laughs> so my question is this: There's a lot of components in GitHub and a lot of things that you can use. There's, you know, bug tracking. There's a website. There's all these pieces. But when I fire up a new project, I kind of have to spin up all of these, and it's you know, quite labor-intensive to tie them all together. It would be nice if there was a very basic, essentially completely unformatted website with at least links to all these basic components every time I set up a new source code repository so that there's at least something there and I don't have to go find the issue tracker or, you know, hey, go to this actual GitHub page to, give me a, 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 to submit a pull request. You know, there's a... There's a you know, at least a basic page up there with all that information as well. So having all that prefabbed out when I say, hey, GitHub, spin up this new tree for me, that would be a huge time savings. So let me ask you a quick question to just before we ask for the vote. Are you thinking that, could, like, so for example, earlier on I suggested a GitHub page to say, mm -hmm. are you thinking like kind of like a pre-built templated website that you make it look like what you want it to be that links to all of your issues and whatever else? Right, that links to all the components that GitHub gives you when you when you commit a source code tree for the first time, right. that it just fires up a basic web page to link all those resources together so that you don't have to go hunting, or so that a user doesn't have to go hunting in the community. If another developer comes along, where's the issue tracker for this? Where's the right. repository for this? Where's the uh, support for this? Where's, you know, all the, where's the, and eventually that would be replaced with the pages, but, you know, where is that for now until that stuff's flushed out? All right, what do we think? All right. Uh, this is another pretty concrete one. Uh, I've noticed in many, many projects and organizations across GitHub, uh, especially as people tend to start doing this microservice-y thing, there's like OpenStack and a million repositories for all of the different pieces of it. Uh, and something that I feel like is kind of missing is a, a deeper bucketing level or tagging level for repositories. If, if I'm a Ruby person and, and I could go to the OpenStack page and see like some random piece of the project is written in Ruby where most aren't, I might be more likely to go towards that one. Or, uh, you know, something like front end, they, these, these are grouped together as front end tools, these are grouped together as back end tools. So, kind of, so when you go and look at an organization, instead of just having a list of repos, it's just it's something that's more illustrative of how these bits fit together. That would also be useful if you've built two complementary, but not the same projects, say a client and a server, which talk to one another. At the moment, they're two separate repos. You can either wedge them both into one repo, or you can make them separate ones, but then you have to kind of link to one from the other. It'd be nice if there was sort of a, these are both parts of this project. Yeah. So what do we think? But it's that guy's idea, not mine. Guy's idea. <laughs> ah. That felt stronger. All right, I'm just, if you see me typing, I'm not checking my email. I'm actually writing things down. <laughs> okay, so. All right, let's go, uh, Kathy. Uh, okay. um, so one thing we use on Launchpad a lot for elementary is cross-project issues. Um, so if there's a common issue that affects multiple projects, uh, we can file that as affecting more than one of our uh, repositories. Um, that's one thing that's lacking a lot for us on GitHub that we'd really like to see. Cross-project issues. What do we think of that? Okay, I'm just making notes to who, where we're looking in terms of popularity. Hang on, bear with me. All right. Right. And then I'll move to this side. I promise I'm not just prioritizing all these. People. So if you want to refer back to this, it's in your email. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but my, uh, my thing is we have a ton of developers who follow us on Google+, but they're the same people who follow us on GitHub. And it seems kind of silly that all the time we're, we're putting things in Google+, and then linking back to GitHub when they're already watching our uh, repository on GitHub. It'd be nice if just on the right-hand side of the repo there was just like a little 
little like I can put notifications in there, put information in there that maybe even shows up in their feed whenever they, you know, look at the notifications that, you know, is like a microblogging thing, like a, like Twitter, you know, but it's specifically related to this repository of this organization on GitHub. All right. What do we think of that one? Okay. I want to move to this side. Low track of blood. Just increase the visibility into any given project. A lot of projects you go to, unless someone's taken the effort, you kind of have to know them, you know, know that if you go to whatever slash wiki, you can get to a wiki, you can get to this, that, and the other. When you go to a lot of GitHub pages, unless someone's put the effort to put that there, that you have no idea that's there to begin with. So you're thinking about when you go to github.com slash whatever, slash whatever. When you go to github.com slash sizzling bacon, you know, that, this, that it says, you know, wiki, you know, issue tracker and all that at the top of those. Which sounds like this chap's suggestion about, yeah. Ah, so we're seeing some commonality of feedback here, which is good. It's chap in the red. Right. Oh, yeah, let's do a vote. Well, it's the same one, but I think we've already... Okay, if you think it's the same one, then I've got another one for you. All right. Wait, if you think it's the same one, then I'll give you a different one. No. We need, we need to move to other people. <laughs> I want to get right... I don't think I need this. Um, this. This is about building communities, and what he's talking about is being able to use GitHub as we all use it, but have the community portion of it actually be, I hate the word wizard, just be able to pick and choose, yes, I want to add a public side to this, yes, I want to add a wiki to this, yes, I want to add this. He's absolutely right. That's sorely needed. Um, to support any sort of project where you have interaction with people. So you're thinking, just to reiterate, so maybe I wasn't sure if everybody could hear, but the idea of essentially like more of a wizardy type onboarding for community members. There's two ways to build a project. I, I know what I'm doing, I just want to repository for I'm building a community. Here, I, what are the tools available to you? Gotcha. What do we think of that one? All right. Let's. Uh, why don't we go over to? Why don't we go over to my friend over here? You what? He really wants an octocan. I think I should give him the smaller one out of spite. <laughs> yeah. So on the same uh, kind of building community theme that we're on here. Um, one thing, because usually when you go to GitHub, you know exactly uh, what you're, like you're going to go there, you're going to contribute, you're going to look at the single page. But building community as a new GitHub user, because honestly I started get with GitHub like maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago maybe. Um, it would be nice to be able to um, take, have a, now I don't know if it does this yet, is a, kind of an underlying tagging system for each repo to where the repo, um, not tagging as in like branch tagging, but um, say it's using Postgres or using the technologies that you're using and you can tag it and then as a new GitHub user, once you start watching one GitHub or one, uh, one project, GitHub might say, you know, you like this project, and this project's pretty similar, and it's more active, and it could kind of drive new, new users and old users to new projects that they might not have ever heard of otherwise. So you're thinking this is within the wider GitHub. This is not yeah. for a specific people or organization. This no, this I'm is interested in Foo, and it shows you projects that relate to Foo. Yeah, right. yeah, and stuff that you've, you're, you're watching and 
GitHub just says, kind hey, of you like know, your metadata logic. Metadata for, right, for finding yeah. projects. Yes. Cool. Thoughts? Oh, that's getting close. Uh, hang on. Stay with me. Yeah, watching me type's exciting, isn't it? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, hang on. Sorry. I typed it in wrong. Okay. That's better. All right. Let's go to someone else. Maybe on this side. We'll, we'll jump on back to this side. On the left hand side of the. Yeah, you. Yeah, you. <laughs> Um, so, for me at least, I'll frequently do a Google search trying to find an answer to some small problem. I'll see a bunch of GitHub repositories come up for programming stuff, but I know I'm going to have a large code base that I'm just shuffling through or possibly an issue. I'll usually click the Stack Overflow link because I get a nice, concise code sample I can reference. Yeah. Um, GitHub already has the concept of like a paste bin, a, a gist there that yeah, you can yeah. paste. and I think it'd be nice to try and expose, um, like incorporate that into the repository. So if a repository is a really good example of the proper way to do a puppet deployment or of some really clean Ruby um, coding or something like that, hmm. um, try and expose not the repository per se, um, but try and expose the specific snippet or the specific issue there a bit more use it so that people can use GitHub as a better reference for learning more. And by doing that, if they're frequently finding the same project or individuals or anything like that, it'll be another incentive for them to try and contribute back. So you're thinking, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, because I'm usually wrong, um, but it's essentially concise nuggets of information like Stack Overflow, Stack Exchange, for a particular project, but essentially uh, like a, a library of that within the repo that gets the Google juice that can bring people into it. Yeah, right? something like that. Um, I don't know necessarily about a library, but try and expose at a finer level than just a project. Right. What do we think of that? God, this is getting difficult. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go, let's go the, up the back in the far corner. All right, let me write that down. So for public projects, uh, particularly feature requests, I would love to see upvotes for issues. So there's not a shitload of plus one comments, and then maybe a filter or something, I don't know, it could be just a, v a new view on the issues page, but being able to sort issues based on upvotes. So for open projects, when people have feature requests or even just high impact bugs, you could instantly get a gauge of what the community actually desires and wants out of the project. So quick question about that, are you talking about to be a way of upvoting the overall issue, or are you talking about upvotes for individual comments on an issue? No, for the overall issue. Okay. So it could be feature requests to be like a new thing, but it could just be a new view on issues itself. That would be awesome. It's kind of similar to, there's a hotness rating in Launchpad. It's kind of similar to that. What do we think of that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> ah, the plot thickens. people have touched on this, but they haven't said it exactly, which is better searching. So I have had this problem. I was working on a project, and it was in two different repositories. There was no way to search both repositories. It's really difficult. So sometimes I jump out to Google and search from there so I can get back to where I'm going. And um, I would just think it would be very helpful to have more modern search. And just to clarify this, you mean the searchability of finding stuff overall in GitHub? Yeah, so basically a lot of times I'm looking for, I want to see how they, how they did something. Like I was looking for a particular piece of code. There's a company called Shotgun. They make software. They have it on GitHub. But uh, rather than just going and asking, hey, you know, is this broken, I can just go look at the code and see what they did. 
Oh, I see. And so I would do that a lot and actually have them fix it in GitHub as opposed to me fixing it. But it would also be nice to be able to say, hey, I found this broken piece of code and have a nice way to tell people. And the other thing that I've found when I'm searching is sometimes GitHub pages go away, but then it's not very pleasant when you get there. You know, other people have referenced it, like in Stack Overflow, they'll say, oh, yeah, this solution is here on GitHub. Right. But sometimes even the person who wrote it says that, but then their GitHub has gone away for some reason. Gotcha. What do we think of that idea? Better searching. Okay. You. I'm terrified to ask you. Mike, it's on its way. This is actually a real suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> Be um, nice. Well, and, um, one of the things to make, to help you build a community as a project maintainer is to ensure that you're not really, really annoyed by the experience on issues. Um, so as a project maintainer, please, 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 a plus one button so people don't just post plus one as a comment. Well, that was like... I'd say it's different. You're talking about the individual comment, right? Yes. Or is, I think the suggestion of there was likes for the overall issue thread. Is that correct? I think they count as the same thing. So, so the idea back there was that instead of posting plus one, people would hit up an, an upvote button and that would be it. Oh, okay. um, then that's the same idea. Give that guy the cat. Ah, so you're, <laughs> ah, so you're after the cat, are you? <laughs> Terrible human being. <laughs> Well, coming from the Ubuntu community, one thing that's missing on GitHub is a proper translation solution because for one, everyone has a GitHub account, but translations are pretty hard and it would be great to have a translation solution which is usable for everyone even if he or she doesn't even know how to use Git. So you think a translations facility built into, into GitHub? Right. Okay. Thoughts on that? God, I'm looking forward to figuring this one out. It's going to get lynched. <laughs> I wish I brought more Octa cats. <laughs> All right, so why don't we take one more? Oh, guys, it's like picking between your children. <laughs> I'm going to take a very technical approach. Eeny, meeny, miny, This chap here. I do a lot of, uh, well, I work with JavaScript a lot, and um, looking up um, new packages, uh, NPM packages, invariably gets me to a GitHub page. Um, but usually, um, if I'm looking for a cryptography package or a new MVC package, um, I usually have to backtrack back to Google um, because I don't have a sense of... Um, how popular that package is and what other alternatives that they are. So along the lines of enhancing the search within um, the NPM, um, sorry, the GitHub website, if GitHub could have a sense of um, package repos, um, so I could maybe add an NPM filter and then I could get a list of the most popular NPM um, packages that are, have their source code has hosted on GitHub. Um, and GitHub already has a great um, sorting uh, methodology using the stars, and that would really simplify my search for high-quality packages and make that really quick. All right. What do we think of that one? All right. I think I've found that way. So first of all, I want to say a big thank you to all of you for your wonderful suggestions. I personally, and I know you're all going to disagree with this, because there was lots of similar clapping. My view is that the winner was upvotes for issues. So come and get your Octocad. So, there you go. <laughs> All right. um, and my... My feeling, not just because of the applause, but also the, reg the regularity from a few people, I think a GitHub pages templated website was clearly number two. So. <laughs> You're going to have to share this also account among like four or five people. <laughs> the, 
the one thing I can tell you, I can't comment on the upvotes for issues. Uh, I don't know just if that's on the roadmap or anything like that. The one thing I can tell you about the templated website is that's actually something I've already put into my project plan, is I think that that's really important, making it really easy for people to get started. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to see something like that in the next six to eight months. So. Right. In my mind, the pages there will be something you would deploy yourself. You don't. It wouldn't. You wouldn't be forced into it. So. All right. That's where my, you know, making those across the top become just more do. You know, it's not there unless you know it's there. Right. So. It's, and the other big thing that they do to make you know get actually really usable. To make one thing they could do to make get really usable. Someone needs to finally get a clue and copy OpenSUSE's build service. So building something like the OpenSUSE build service behind Git to where you can have the packages built there. So now we have a more trusted system for package builds. So I don't have to pull it, you know, if I'm pulling down an you know, RPM from the creator, I'm not pulling it from them. I'm pulling it from Git where I've got a little more trust that they're not doing something to manipulate the file. All right. These. All right. Thank you, everybody. I know this was like the end of the day. Thank you for coming along. Thank you, Mr. Vincent.